Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we have a pair of amazing guests for you all. First, we talk with Joshua Ravage, NASA's lead mechanical engineer for the Ingenuity Helicopter on Mars. We'll discuss the design, testing, and operation of this remarkable little robotic explorer. Next, we're going to be joined by Andrew Pesikis, National Geographic's Night Sky Guy, discussing amateur astronomy, science, and exploring the cosmos. But first, we'll examine a new study showing ways that oxygen might be produced on planets in the absence of life and what that could possibly mean in the search for life on other worlds. Next, we look in on a newly discovered rocky world not too far from our own home. Then we're going to journey out to the edge of our planetary family where the New Horizons spacecraft reaches a historic milestone. Exoplanets with oxygen are likely targets in the search for extraterrestrial life. But the presence of this gas doesn't necessarily mean life forms might be found on an alien world. Simulations carried out at UC Santa Cruz examined possible evolutionary paths for exoplanets, finding several scenarios where oxygen might be produced on worlds without the presence of life forms. A new generation of telescopes could find life on other worlds in the coming years, but doing so will require multiple lines of evidence in addition to oxygen in alien atmospheres. One newly discovered exoplanet, GJ740b, found in data from the now defunct Kepler spacecraft, is a super-Earth but it's no place to call home. This world orbits its star at a distance just about 3% of the distance that Earth keeps from our own sun. This rocky planet races around its small red dwarf star once every two days and 16 hours. Evidence was also seen for a possible Saturn-like world further out in the system, but this has not yet been confirmed. At the edge of our planetary family, the New Horizons spacecraft, the only robotic explorer to yet visit Pluto, reached a milestone few spacecraft have marked before. On April 17th, the spacecraft reached a distance 50 times further from the sun than the Earth keeps. Only four other craft have reached this remarkable distance. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Ingenuity, the first helicopter ever designed to fly on another world, now sits on the surface of Mars ready for its historic flight. We talked with, Nashua, uh, with NASA's Joshua Ravitch, lead mechanical engineer for this remarkable little robotic explorer. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to talk with Joshua Ravitch. 
He is the mechanical engineering lead for NASA, working on the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. Welcome to the show, Josh. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, really happy to be here. Great. Uh, so uh, just tell us in general, what is Ingenuity for those who may not be familiar with it? And what are you folks hoping to accomplish with this? Uh, so Ingenuity is a, a small uh, uh, technology demonstration. It's a small helicopter uh, or drone, uh, really. It's a wingspan, well, hard to show on the screen, wingspan about four feet, 1.2 meters, uh, mass about four ki uh, two kilograms, a little less than two kilograms, so about four pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a technology demonstration that's meant to demonstrate the first uh, you know, powered uh, aircraft on another planet. And we're hoping, you know, in the, the not too not too distant future, um, yeah, to demonstrate that first flight on, on the margin surface. Uh, so um, I've heard some people talk about this, but so this is roughly not that much larger than drones that some people may have flown. Tell us what are, what are some of the big differences? I mean, obviously, other than um, you know the remarkable difference in conditions that you had to deal with. You know, how is this similar to or different than drones? Uh, well, a lot of a lot of it is actually quite similar. A lot of the technology we're using for electronics are uh, uh, it's you know equipment, electronic components you'd find in earthbound drones. Um, however, there are quite a few differences. Uh, you'll notice that the blades look uh, a bit different than you'd see on a normal Earth drone. Uh, that actually has to do with the Martian atmosphere. Uh, so while you know gravity is a third, uh, you know roughly a third of, of uh, gravity on Earth, the atmospheric density uh, on the surface of Mars is about one one hundredth of the the uh, atmospheric uh, you know pressure at uh, at sea level on Earth. So um, that'd be equivalent of like a hundred thousand feet, you know, on our planet, just to kind of put it in perspective. Uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, blade That's design than is any uh, jet yeah. flies higher than far higher than yeah, Earth. about That's right. All right. Yep. Yeah, about three times the height of Mount Everest. Right. So um, yeah, the the blades are um, yeah kind of specially designed to handle that atmospheric pressure. Uh, as well, control is a little bit different in in that pressure too. On on Earth, the uh, you know we've got very nice uh, you know air kind of bouncing around as the blades spin around. They you know they actually vibrate quite a bit. On Earth, that air kind of you know mitigates a lot of that vibration. Where on Mars, it, it doesn't. So being able to control through you know much uh, kind of a much more difficult, uh, you know, vibration, uh, vibrational environment, um, you know, certainly, a, certainly a trick as well, because uh, you have very low lift, uh, you know, it's very hard to generate lift because of the atmospheric pressure. Uh, we, we have to keep mass down quite a bit. So um, you'll notice that it looks kind of thin. There's a lot of uh, black material that's carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. that's meant to, you know, keep mass down really low that, uh, if uh, you can see a photo of it, if they can see your background, there's a picture of it there, which is nice over your shoulder. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that's a thin, yeah, that's a thin little uh, thermal uh, thermal film that encloses all the the electronics, as opposed to like a big heavy chassis, um, you know, keep everything in. Uh, so you know, we had to cut a lot of corners to try to, uh, you know, survive the very cold uh, March nights to get them as much lift as we needed, as well. Um, we also have a, you might probably see this on some earthbound drones, but we do have a, at the way top of the, the vehicle, there's a solar array. Uh, we have to live on our own. So we have to charge through solar energy, through that solar array on the top, charge a pretty big battery pack on the inside. Uh, and then, you know, that, that energy from the batteries uh, not only lets us fly, but also, you know, keeps us warm throughout the night, which is actually <laughs> quite a bit uh, of a burden. Um, most, uh, truth be told, most of the energy in our batteries goes to, to staying warm uh, throughout, you know, throughout the day on Mars. I believe that. And there have been issues before with um, dust covering solar cells yes. on Martian rovers and landers. And But uh, this is supposed to be a one-month mission, so is it that you don't think that might be a problem over that amount of time? or? 
so far, uh, yeah, so far we feel pretty good about it. There's already some dust on the solar array since we've deployed from Perseverance a few weeks ago. Um, that hasn't really affected our, you know, our ability to, you know, generate the power. The solar array is still, you know, meeting the performance that we, you know, uh, we, we, we hoped for. So, so far so good. We've done some modeling too, just to see, you know, yeah, if you turn on the blades, they start spinning around, how much dust is going to recirculate? We don't think it's going to be too much. Um, so yeah, we feel, yeah, we feel pretty good about it. That's great. So why'd you go for a helicopter and not say a glider or some weird sort of jet designed to fly in low atmosphere? Uh, <laughs> that is a great question. Um, yeah, I'm sure all those have their benefits too. Uh, uh, you know, I get that question a lot too. Or like, yeah, blimps, why not a blimp? Um, yeah, I think all of those have, have a lot of benefits. Uh, you know, we had to pick something. We went with a helicopter. There's a lot of benefits to helicopter. You know, it's very versatile. It can hover in place. So if you wanted to actually inspect a specific, you know, area, you could actually hover over it and, and you know, with, with no problem, right? Where if you're flying a, a jet, you know, you'd be you know, circulating around um, as well. You know, pretty good, uh, you know, performance, you know, controls. You can go up, you can go this ways, go that ways, go any ways you kind of want. Um, so it's, a, yeah, it's, pre it's pretty good for future, you know, tasks uh, such as, um, you know, scouting uh, for robotic or, you know, maybe even human ex exploration down the road, as well as for, you know, doing science in very hard to access uh, locations. You know, you could take a helicopter up a mountain, take it down a ravine, you know, go to places you can't go with a rover, go to places you can't necessarily even go with, you know, with uh, certain other aircraft, uh, aircraft types. All right, that's so cool. And as you mentioned, the, uh, you know, the atmospheric pressure, the surface of Mars is about 1% what it is here on Earth, which, you know, is a huge challenge for you folks. Can you give us some idea of how you got around that? How'd you get a, how'd you design a helicopter that could fly in hardly any air at all? <laughs> It's it's a it's a trick. I mean, at the scale, we were right on the the razor's edge, of um, you know, like I said, uh, the blade design, uh, you know, capable of handling that, you know, that uh, low pressure, um, as well even the controllers. Uh, you know, the first the first time they ever flew one of these, a, a story I like to t I like to tell. Um, I unfortunately wasn't there for this. This is a year or two before I got on the job. Is I think in 2014, uh, the first time they ever generated. Uh, lift at all in Mars pressure it was in a little vacuum chamber uh, you know, back at, uh, you know, at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It was about, uh, I think it was at JPL. It was, I, I'm pretty sure it was that chamber. Anyways, it might or might not have been at on site, but it was in some jet vacuum chamber, about this big, maybe six inch square, little road, uh, little helicopter. And they had a very experienced uh, person on the control stick trying to fly that thing. Uh, you know, you think normally, uh, well, you go, you, you know, go over to the left, it's going to go left. You know, he moved it one way, it went the, the absolute other way. <laughs> wow. So, um, wow. yeah, so it's just, yeah, it interacts really differently with, with, the, with the air at that pressure. So uh, we learned from that, you, you can't actually fly this by hand. You have to have a computer uh, to be able to do this. Uh, not to say we won't get some like amazing pilot in the future who figures it out, but right now, as far as we know, computer control is the only way to get around, uh, you know, that uh, <laughs> that problem. So a lot of controllers as well. Yeah, keeping the mass down. Um, we're pretty much right at you know at the limit of you know what we could lift with this uh, with this vehicle. Um, there are there's work uh, by the way to you know scale this up to what's the next one right this isn't the limit of size this was the limit of size we could bring on on perseverance, right. um, but. That we have basically nothing in there that is not used for flight right now. The only thing in there that's not fl like used for actual flight operations is one small cell phone sized color camera that that we're gonna take uh, take pictures with. Um, and I think a few of those are actually you know made it to the internet already. Right. Not from the air, but just from the ground. So cool. And um, of course, you know your other big challenge was the cold. Um, how are you? How are you dealing with that, especially when you're trying to keep weight down to such a degree? Oh, uh, you actually hit the nail on the head with that comment. Uh, it's all kind of comes down to mass. Everything we do is mass. You know, you could say, oh, well, let's take another battery um, along to get more, you know, get more energy and stay warmer. But well, now you have to lift that battery up. And if you don't need that battery to actually you generate enough power for lift, it's kind of a losing battle. Uh, the same thing, you know, we could carry more insulation 
you know, we looked at lots of different insulation types, uh, you know, to fit in the vehicle. But he, even that, the amount of heat that it kept in wasn't worth the mass that we had to carry to actually, you know, lift off the ground. So we ended up actually using just thin layers of, of thermal uh, uh, thermal blanketing that, you know, ha are spaced uh, well enough to actually allow the Martian atmosphere itself to be an insulator. Um, if you keep down the convection cells, uh, you know, it doesn't circulate around. Actually, just like just like an animal on Earth, right? You know, they got their fur, keeps the air trapped in, keeps them warm. That's exactly <laughs> exactly what we're doing. That's, that's neat. And um, now, since um, ingenuity has separated from perseverance, um, you folks have mm -hmm. faced a couple of minor challenges, and you're now going through, you know, a software update and such before you can get to the testing the first flights. Can you give us an update on what's happening with the craft? Uh, yeah, so far it's it's pretty uh, happy and healthy. Of course, you know, we're very aware that, you know, <laughs> Uh, we don't want to just be sitting around twiddling our thumbs, which of course we're not. Um, no, of course not. Yeah, you know, we've identified. Yeah, we identified the problem. You know, we've identified the fix. We're just working through the process of you know making sure that fix works right. Um, you know, you don't get to go push the reset button uh, like you would on Earth. So you, you got to make sure it's right. You know, it takes time to get it up there, get it in the vehicle. So yeah, we're just all working through that and working our way, you know, back towards first flight. Right, right. And of course, you know, there's someone out there in, you know, internet land yelling, have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. All right. That's and right. IT rule number two is it plugged in and you reset. And so, you know, so you're going on, I mean, this is such a, it's such a neat, uh, you know, um, amazing revolutionary idea that you folks are working on what for you is some of the coolest tech that you developed oh gosh i don't know i mean all in all together you know i kind of got to you know put my hands on everything in here and you know just uh, all of it was all of it was exciting and neat um right some of the challenge is you know not only building a helicopter right you're building an aircraft but you're also building a spacecraft. It has to have all the systems of spacecraft. It also has to be able to survive launch on a rocket to another planet, which is something that, yeah, most helicopters don't have to do in, in their, in, you know, in operation. So um, I don't know, it's just, yeah, working on all that stuff was just, you know, amazing. So I think just as a whole, you know, knowing that, well, you know, we're working on a helicopter that's going to fly on another planet. Uh, that's, that was probably the, yeah, I mean, the, the big thing for me, right? Um, otherwise, you know, it was really fun trying to solve problems of, well, how do you package all this in there? How do we package the batteries? How do we get the little antenna uh, to work sticking on top? Uh, how do you, you know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of little games we played. The, the solar array, like, has triple function. It's a solar array. It's also our main electrical interface of the rover. It's also our antenna. Um, so, uh, like, kind of does a lot of stuff. So, all that just kind of yeah, I don't know. You pick, you, you point, I mean, you close your eyes, you know, point at something on the vehicle. It's probably really fun to work on and it's probably cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love that attitude. Um, and so naturally the, um, you know, the fact that, you know, it goes in the opposite direction from where you, where you try, where you try to steer it. What, what were some of the biggest surprises for you as you folks are developing this? Uh, you know, that was, that was one of the big ones. Um, other than, other than that, I mean, it's all just, I think it's going to kind of sound weird, but I think the surprise, the surprises we had was how well it's worked so far. Um, you know, not only, you know, Ingenuity, the flight version, but we had engineering models. Um, you know, the first time we turned that on, you know, we did a, a free flight with it, with all the electronics, all the, you know, kind of, uh, you know, control systems, everything in place. Uh, I think the video is somewhere on the internet. Uh, anyways, yeah, that, that thing steady as a rock. And we just, you know, so, uh, we just kind of looked at it and we're like, wow, I kind of can't believe that. Yeah, that's what it's designed to do, but it's still surprising, um, you know, when it does <laughs> when it does what it's supposed to. <laughs> uh, and you know, one of the you know is one of the uh, primary uh, you know things that you folks, as I understand, are trying to get out of this is seeing answering the basic question: Is it possible to fly a helicopter on another on another world? 
and mm -hmm. after, and if this is successful and maybe the next gen um you know titan certainly beckons out so what do you see as being the future of helicopters in space exploration so you mentioned Titan. There is, I think, a project already in work called Dragonfly. Um, and uh, it's out of, I think it's APL and Goddard, maybe. Um, anyways, uh, it's back east. And uh, yeah, they're, they're already working on on that. Hopefully, I'm not sure. If I actually, I'm not working on it, so I don't really know when it's launching. But uh, I, I presume, you know, in the not you know, not so distant, distant future. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that'll be really neat. Uh, you know, Titan's a, another great atmospheric body. Their, their, their uh, pressure is much, much thicker than, than uh, Mars. Um, but yeah, so I think they can handle a much larger vehicle there. That uh, It looks really cool and I'm very excited to see uh, what they're able to do with that. Uh, and then I, I mentioned a little bit earlier uh, too, we're, you know, looking at what's the next thing for Mars. What's, what would the next helicopter look like? How big could we, you know, could we do? And, uh, you know, we're looking at kind of like a, you know, 15 ish kilogram, you know, 10 to 20 kilogram helicopter with a couple kilograms of payload, um, as opposed to this, which is two kilogram, you know, helicopter with, uh, basically no payload. Um, yeah. And lots of applications for that, you know, I mean, science, exploration, human support, robotic support. You know, I think we're just really excited to, you know, to try it out. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Joshua. It was great having you on this show. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Now it was uh, Joshua Ravitch, mechanical engineering lead for the Ingenuity Project for NASA. Amateur astronomers were delighted on the nights of April 16th and 17th when Mars huddled up close to the moon. Next up, we talk with Andrew Pizikas, National Geographic's night sky guy, uh, talking about amateur astronomy and our quest to explore the cosmos. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Andrew Pasikas. He is National Geographic's Night Sky Guide, and he's here to talk about his backyard guide to the night sky and what we can see when we look up. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. All right. So I think, you know, when we talk about amateur astronomy, you know, you know, as Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson and others have mentioned so many times, children are natural astronomers. They want to ask, what are the stars? What is the sun? Um, why, do, why do you think all of us are born with that sort of wonder? Well, yeah, I mean, I think you hit on it in that I think that uh, it's in human DNA, curiosity, generally curiosity. It's in our nature as a species. And I think uh, the curiosity regarding nature, and, and now we're talking particularly about the night sky, goes back, I think, to ancient times when, you know, there was no Nintendo and no smartphones and nothing other than a campfire to sit around at night and worry about those, you know, saber-toothed tigers and stuff. Back then, the big entertainment that night was the night sky and weaving all these wonderful stories that some of them have trickled down over time to us today. So I think there has always been a wonder and we are explorers by nature too as a species. So uh, going out and, and uh, exploring while you and I may not be going on to Mars and other worlds uh, ourselves, we can be along for the ride thanks to the technology that we have. I mean, now if you, you, you know, NASA has, and, and other rocket companies are putting cameras on board their, their, uh, on their missions. So you're along for the ride. We are practically there in real time uh, exploring uh, the universe. And so uh, it's, it's a really interesting time because it's a double-edged sword. We are... I think more connected to the cosmos as a species than ever before because of the technology, but at the same time, the technology has also disconnected us like 
never before in terms of our own personal experience with the night sky, in, especially in large cities where most of us live. All right. that, that's pretty fascinating. I love that. I love that connection. So, you know, you're saying, you know, we, in some ways, we developed our first cultural uh, connection to the stars back before the days of light pollution um, and Nintendos and handy little phones. Um, but how can people use technology to become connected once more? with the cosmos? Well, definitely there's the passive methods of, you know, being, uh, you know, tuned into what, uh, what, you know, space agencies and scientists are doing on missions and, you know, uh, through, you know, these grand uh, observatory facilities that are around the world and in space, we can be tapped into what the scientific discovery is, what the exploration is, as I've said. But I think in terms of us being taking a more active role, a visceral role in ex being acquainted to the night sky and space in general, um, there again, technology can be of service to us. I mean, it's not something that's exclusive uh, uh, that you need technology to explore because the human eye is the best uh, optical uh, you know, instrument that nature has given us in giving us these wide, beautiful views of the overhead skies and getting acquainted to the cosmos that way. And just using the eye, human eye uh, is so impressive. But we have, we are, we can avail ourselves to, of course, books, uh, but also uh, you've got the, the modern technology of apps on smartphones. So many of us are now, it's uh, ubiquitous to have apps on smartphones and having planetarium apps, these specialty apps that help guide you literally by hand uh, to these destinations in the sky has really been a revolution, I think, in astronomy, communication, and education. I was being able to, again, be along for the ride, but be in control, in the, not I would say not along for that, but maybe be in the driver's seat more of where we're, you know, how do we want to learn about the night sky? We can do that with our technology. You couple that, you know, maybe with a telescope, these modern telescopes now, some of them are, uh, are equipped with robotified, uh, you know, views of those distant objects in the sky. So even the uninitiated, someone who has no experience with astronomy, visual astronomy, can get up and running now with technology uh, and start exploring the deep cosmos like never before. And so if someone were to want to get either get into amateur astronomy for the first time or perhaps, you know, look up at the night sky for the first time since they were a kid or with their own child, where, where would be a good place to start for them? So when it comes to uh, learning, starting that journey, that personal journey of uh, learning and navigating the night sky, whether you're doing it alone or whether you're doing it with, uh, uh, with a child or, or a partner, whatever, uh, really uh, it starts with base, getting that basic understanding of the night sky. Now, if you're fortunate enough, you may have uh, access to amateur astronomy clubs in your area, which are a wonderful resource because these are folks that have really put their heart and soul into the hobby of um, astronomy. They've done a lot of the hard work already in, in knowing what instruments to get and how te tips and techniques. So it's a wonderful resource to avail yourself to any local astronomy club that is in your area. And it's a good way to learn about, you know, maybe how can I put it, you know, kick the tires in terms of, of a telescope. Don't, don't kick the telescope. I'm not, <laughs> not that thing, but you at, know what at, I mean. At least not after you've aligned it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you don't want that. But the idea is just that you become familiar with it, what's there, and you could try for free at a star party. You go around and looking through telescope and ask some questions. They're there to answer. So amateur astronomers are just a gem of a resource, highly recommended. But of course, the internet is there for you to avail yourself. If you're looking to buy a telescope or binocular, try to look for uh, retailers that are specialists in astronomy uh, supplies. Uh, they tend 
tend to hire amateur astronomers to work on staff as well to answer questions knowledgeably. So um, that's right. And don't expect to pay a mint to get into uh, equipment. You, you know, a good pair of binoculars, if you're lucky, you could get maybe 75 bucks to $300 approximately in that range for a nice pair of binoculars. A telescope starting at around $200. There's some very good entry level beginner telescopes, family friendly telescopes. And so you want to take that time to make that right purchase and choosing a telescope. And then of course it comes to using that equipment. That's where like, uh, like my book, the the night sky guy uh, guide, right, is uh, basically uh, something that will give you uh, tips on you know what you should look for when you're ready for those things. But all of this means though that you could still start at home, no matter where you are. Even if you're living in the city downtown, you have a balcony, a, a bedroom window to look through, you're stuck inside, you can't physically get outside. And today, let's be honest, a lot of us can't travel. We're limited in what we can do under the current circumstances. So astronomy is, is amazing because you can do it where everywhere. As long as you've got a clear view of the sky, you know, or partly clear, you have something that you can connect to in the with the cosmos. Um, so what do you think the biggest surprise is when people look through a telescope for the first time? Oh my gosh, you know, looking at the night sky generally, I love, this is where it really feeds my, feeds my passion. It's just like, this is where I, I, it's my uh, return on investment is seeing that, that <laughs> light bulb go off or that uh, surprise. You know, I think probably the most standard, and you'll hear this everywhere around the world from amateur farmers who do conduct public star parties, when they set up the telescope and they point it at Saturn. Right? Yes. That's what yeah. we call the wow, the wow planet. Because mm -hmm. what do we have they never, You know, they definitely, they'll say something. Sometimes it's a curse word, you can't say. But, <laughs> but they, an expletive, but they'll say, wow, you know, when they see Saturn in those rings. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that is... That's a planet, Jupiter and its moons, to see the cloud belts of Jupiter and moon. Uh, seeing Orion Nebula, uh, actually through a telescope, especially if you have like a filter, or like a light pollution filter or something attached, you can really set it up. And if you've got it in, a, uh, in the right place at the right time, you see the, almost looks like a downward, uh, downward uh, shape, um, uh, flower, a blooming flower shape. It's absolutely fantastic. You, can see, you won't see the colors in this backyard telescope, the, the pinks and greens, but you see the beautiful shape of tapestry. And of course, that's a star factory 1600 light years away, right? right. So that's wow factor, you know, or you know what I, I, even something more simpler, not even a telescope, I'll tell you, uh, uh, what's, what's a big thing for people, a big uh, revelation is, to, for instance, going from uh, from my book, uh, if you see in any star chart, you see the Big Dipper, right? And the Big Dipper, how big is it on a star chart? It's about this big, right? And star chart on the book. But right. in the sky, right, to take that, what is it? It's huge. It takes it's huge. Like a huge, massive part. And it's that revelation I love of people when I'm teaching. I do a workshop or something and I go, let's go outside and see the Big Dipper. You know, they're looking for the Big Dipper this big, right? Newbies, right. when when they look through a book, a sky guide or a star chart, they're looking, well, okay, it's this big here. So they think it's some really compact and discreet little collection of stars. That's what the Big Dipper is. And they, it's a complete uh, epiphany for them when they see that it, it's a huge piece of real estate above their heads and go, ah. And then what happens is that they understand what, how to look for the other constellations, that they are actually big celestial real estate chunks in the sky. Yeah, they get it. And I love that. That's the payoff. All right. And finally, and this is a question I asked of Neil deGrasse Tyson a couple of weeks ago. What do we, in this critical time, you know, when we're facing, you know, these global challenges of the, of the pandemic and uh, global climate change, what do we do to encourage science? Well, this is where visual astronomy, stargazing, comes in big time. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it's a journey that everybody must take for themselves. It's not something, and it's and it's something that they have to kind of. It's it's like this epiphany that I said. It's a moment where everyone has to have that. Now, 
the journey may start by turning on, you know, flipping through your Instagram feed and seeing that image of Mars, you know, from the helicopter ingenuity that'll come. That might be your epiphany, but it might also be that you go outside and, and you're barbecuing and you see that beautiful night sky. That is where the journey starts. And, uh, you know, the night sky is a shared heritage for all of humanity. It's something that belongs to us and our, our, our great grandparents and belongs to our great grandchildren. We are just stewards on this great spaceship, the earth. You know, we're here for a short little piece of time and we, it's our responsibility to give, give forward this wonderful heritage we have. And so to conserve the night sky, everybody can do a part in making sure that we have responsible lighting, for instance. Uh, it's our responsibility, uh, those of us that are parents and those of us that have influence on the next generation to, to go on that journey. Like I said, you don't have to be necessarily the teacher, but you have to have the open mind to make that step in exploring. And so that's what I hope for in terms of humanity is the night sky is a wonderful stepping stone. It's a, it's a spark that could lead, uh, especially youngsters today, I think, uh, to actually start going into STEM, STEM uh, fields. Uh, we need more science knowledge. And even if you never become a scientist and that's not going to be in your, just having an appreciation and an understanding of science is important. That is the future of humanity. If where we're, you know, where humanity is going is going to be built on our knowledge and appreciation of science. Uh, so um, I think we can all do our part. And the easy is one of the easiest is just exploring the night sky that's above all our heads, and that's a great place to start. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Andrew. It's great talking with you. It really was my pleasure, uh, and I, I wish all of your watchers clear skies. And clear skies to you. And that was Andrew Fasigas, National Geographic's Night Sky Guy. Make sure to tune in next week when we'll be joined by Orhad Harley, uh, CEO of Light Loop, discussing new technology for storing data in space. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. Yes, you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net